It's a great pleasure to welcome uh, Marco Siciliano to our last uh, performance research lecture of this uh, season. Um, we generally end by the Easter break and these uh, seminars run in the fall and in the winter. And uh, every fortnight, like in music, like in our neighboring fields, we try to bring in a guest who is either uh, far ahead in their career and can tell us about you know, what they have accomplished and where they are now going, or we're looking at younger artists and scholars like Marco who are, uh, of course, already established in their own way as composers and performers, but are now here uh, at this university completing also a PhD study. So um, your research involves the relationship of music and composition to light and you are making new forays into understanding of perception of light and music. And please share with us your current research. And you saw the title, it's an unusual uh, concept, the notion of the dirty light. We look forward uh, to hearing and seeing what you are presenting. Please welcome Marco Siciliano. <laughs> Thank you very much and thank you for being here and thank you Johannes for giving me this opportunity to present my work here. Uh, well, as Johannes already mentioned, I'm a composer. I studied classical composition and so for a quite long time I had a fascination to, uh, in combining sound with light. And incidentally, I had uh, the opportunity to make experiments with it and uh, the more I worked with light, the more I was, in a way, intrigued uh, by the combination that uh, this offered. And uh, two years ago, I eventually decided to start a PhD here at Brunel University and to deepen my research in the possibilities that lighting and music offer as uh, two media to be combined. And uh, what I'm going to do today is uh, to give you, uh, yes, like a quick survey of uh, the work that I'm doing and especially also an impression of the research that I've been doing so far. When I'm working with light, I have to say, well, being a composer, I'm also usually approaching it almost as a sort of visual medium, which is in its origin musical. So I often apply musical principles uh, to lighting and uh, in a certain sense, I, yeah, I do perceive it as a sort of unaudible musical parameter which functions through vision. And uh, in this approach, this has a lot of common with the idea of a sort of a visual music, which is a term which became first very popular in the early 20th century in uh, early experimental film where uh, different artists worked uh, with vision in a time-based manner and sought analogies in music as a sort of other abstract form of uh, time-based art. And I looked at um, visual music is a very broad field and uh, still today it's uh, very popular and it has had a sort of renaissance also through a number of softwares that are making it uh, quite easy to combine video and music nowadays, for example, jitter or uh, PD jam or processing. And uh, there are many different ideas and definitions of visual music uh, floating around. And I would just like to start with two definitions that I found that I find also relevant for my work. So one definition says that visual music is a visualization of music, which is the translation of a specific musical composition or sound into a visual language, with the original syntax being emulated in the new visual rendition. Another definition would also be that um, visual music is a time-based visual structure that is similar to the structure of a kind or style of music it is a new composition created visually as if it were an oral piece. This can have sound or it can also exist uh, silently. Um, before I go more into details, I would just like to give you a clear impression of the way how I'm working with light. 
my field of interest is uh, using lighting as a time-based medium. So I'm not so much using lighting as a sort of, uh, I'm not using static lighting in order to create an atmosphere. I do think that uh, the power of light to create a certain sphere is a very strong element of it, something what I definitely also have to take into account when working with it. But this is not the main motivation for working with light for me. And uh, so I'm using it in a time-based uh, manner, and I'm structuring it usually in such a way that it has an identifiable beginning, a middle, and an end corresponding to the music that I composed along with it. And uh, which means I'm not so much working in the field of sound installations. For, for example, uh, you have installations that are running in cycles that don't have an identifiable beginning or end. As a sort of necessity, in order to be able to control the lighting, I'm using artificial light, uh, no natural light or candles. The equipment I use is mostly uh, lighting equipment from a theater or uh, equipment which was developed for club-like situations. Uh, it's usually, uh, I have a preference for LED lamps because they are very fast in their response, but I also work with laser and often I just have to use the equipment I find at a particular location. Generally, I'm avoiding canvas-like elements that function as a window into the uh, yeah, so-called world of visuals. This is something what I find characteristic about the uh, majority of uh, video presentations where you have like a clearly identifiable screen which in a way works like a canvas or like a window into another world. In a way, I'm also interested in by using lighting also to emphasizing the space that the performance is taking place in. And also, I'm avoiding to create visual objects like uh, concrete images. And uh, when working with laser, this is to a certain extent uh, inevitable. But uh, when I work with shapes, I'm either trying, like there's one piece where then I deliberately used extremely simple shapes. And when the room allows it, I also like to use uneven surfaces to project uh, light on light or laser which uh, then in a way also emphasizes the space where the performance is uh, taking place in. So before continuing, I would like to play a short excerpt from a piece which I composed in uh, 2007. Um, this is an excerpt from a piece which lasts about an hour. It's called My Ultra Deep Eye and I wrote it for uh, my own group which uh, here consisted of six performers. The group is called Back in Zoop. I uh, set up this group a couple of years ago also to have a platform where I can develop compositions, usually longer compositions, that make use of lighting and uh, music. And here is an excerpt from, well, from the premiere of this piece.
So in this piece, the uh, setup that I'm, that I'm using for the lighting is, uh, first of all, these three balloons in the foreground. And then, as you saw, there are also projections of different colors on the three screens around the musicians. And um, when I'm applying, for example, musical pr principles to the organization of lighting, this can, uh, in the first place, affect uh, rhythmic structures, dynamics, uh, textures of sound in relation to lighting, or uh, the spatialization where a sound is positioned uh, or where a certain light source is positioned. Um, what's often very relevant and what was probably also well visible in this example is that uh, the re relationship of uh, rhythm in light to the rhythm in music is uh, of special concern to me. One extreme way to use the two is just by synchronizing everything, and the other extreme would be to have an extreme independence from the two. Um, uh, I personally don't uh, favor these extremes form that much. The, when there is too much synchrony, for my taste, there is too much redundancy also, simply because it's a doubling of uh, what you already see or hear in the other mi medium. And uh, for me, it's also important to have a relationship between the two that can be felt. So I'm usually trying to find a solution in between. And uh, also in the example that you just saw, the rhythmic elements that are used in the lighting are independent from what you see, uh, what you hear in the music. But there is all, uh, still a relationship between the two. For example, they are sharing the same pulse and um, on a more global scale, I'm also using rhythms in this piece uh, that are uh, shared between sound and music, but they are not necessarily occurring at the same time. So I might use a certain rhythmic principle uh, in a certain uh, point of the piece in the music, which then at another point comes back in lighting. And I'm uh, trying to establish a well, basically structural relationships in such ways. When I started out working with sound and light, I was in a way fascinated by a number of uh, common aspects that both share. For example, uh, both sound and light are projected from singular sources, like you have either a lamp or a loudspeaker or an instrument, uh, which is a more or less punctual source of either sound or light. Um, as a consequence, both are emitted into space in a three-dimensional way. Both are also strongly affected by the environment they are placed in. So the character of acoustics is uh, shaped by the various reflections and absorptions uh, of the materials in a room, and uh, the same is also the case for lighting. The, the way how you perceive light in a space also depends on well, on the environment, on the materials, and the reflective characteristics of the surfaces found in a space. Both are, this is some more abstract, but still both are forms of energy. Sound consists of waves of air pressure, light of electromagnetic waves, and both music and art of light are also uh, abstract forms of art. However, there are also a number of differences between sound and light, especially in the way how we perceive sound and light. For example, sound perception and visual perception have uh, their own pace. Generally speaking, the ear analyzes and processes faster than the eye. For example, if you see a flash of light at 10 times a second, it's uh, quite stressful information for, for the eye, whereas when you uh, hear uh, a pulse 10 times a, uh, a second, it's um, not really creating any stress for the ear to process. Then uh, physiologically, the ear cannot adjust to loud volume as the eye can to bright light. The ear doesn't have an iris. Therefore, you could say that uh, loud volume is a more direct or absolute experience for the ear, whereas uh, the, light, uh, the eye can more easily adjust. So intensities of light are much more relative 
uh, dependent on the context than intensity and of volume in music. Different sounds can uh, easily mask each other and uh, different projections of light, uh, however, do not interfere with each other. And uh, also connected to that, overlapping color projections, on the other hand, create mixed colors where the color components often cannot be recognized. Also with music, when you instrumentate uh, very carefully, you can create sounds that are, well, where the sound is that melted together, that's very hard to tell what the single components, the single instruments are. But that's uh, relatively hard to achieve. I would say that generally speaking, the, eye can, uh, the ear can uh, analyze quite well what the different instruments are. Usually, um, sounds stay relatively separated. Unless one is much louder than the other, then it's uh, getting completely covered up. But that also, again, depends on various parameters, like the range and colors of the instruments. Um, noise and dirt, well, that's maybe the biggest difference that I encountered when uh, thinking about sound and light and what relationship they can have uh, in respect to each other. Um, noise has been a very important source of uh, inspiration in the history of music, uh, in Western music at least. You could, uh, I would say that you could rewrite music history by uh, analyzing how the line between no what is considered noise and musical material has constantly been relocated. This is something that is certainly very characteristic of the 20th century, which has in a way been, well, almost obsessed with the search for uh, new territories and new ways to produce sound. But I think it's something that's uh, generally valid for uh, Western music. Also how dissonances that were first a taboo were gradually accepted to be part of musical material. And uh, at first I couldn't really find an equivalent uh, for light because light as a medium cannot be easily situated within such polar polarities. Light, in a way, is simply light and you can't extend it. You can't all of a sudden introduce a new element which becomes light. And it's also difficult to think uh, of light. For example, you, when you think of painting, you can analyze also the history of paint and how it interacted with the history of uh, painting as an art genre. And uh, I find it much more difficult to differentiate these categories uh, with lighting, simply because the medium is very fixed. And uh, however, I do believe that it's possible also, well, first I, I thought maybe light is just condemned to be this uh, pure medium which cannot be rendered dirty in any way. And uh, also not by coincidence, light has very often symbolized a sort of pureness in many cultures. It's also symbolizing uh, gods or divine powers. However, I do believe that uh, it's possible to use light in contexts where it can also take on the effect of uh, what noise is doing with music. While I was uh, doing my research in different sources and uh, different understandings of what noise can be, I uh, eventually came to differentiate the two different sorts of noise. One of them I would like to call syntactic noise. And uh, I would like to explain that with a quote from Mary Douglas. Mary Douglas is an anthropologist who has done a lot of research in the field of uh, taboo and how dirt and uh, pureness is dealt with in different cultures. And what she says about dirt, I think it can be also applied to noise. Mary Douglas says that dirt is matter out of place. This implies two conditions, a set of ordered relations and a contravention of that order. Dirt then is never a unique isolated event. Where there is dirt, there is system. 
and dirt is a byproduct of a systematic ordering and classification of matter in so far as ordering involves rejecting inappropriate elements. So I think you could also say that noise is matter out of place, uh, sounds which don't immediately work within a established musical idiom. So it's uh, very context dependent and you can't really uh, make a definition of noise uh, which is true for all different uh, styles of music, for example. At the same time, I would also like to add another quote from Paul Haggerty, who wrote actually a history of music in the 20th century from the point of view how noise was con uh, constantly redefined and how different source of noise um, started to play a role into music and became part of a musical idiom. And what he's saying is that noise and the music that comes from an engagement with it tests commonplace notions of hearing and listening and tries to destabilize not just our expectations of content or artistic form, but how we relate to those to the point where the most interesting point of encounter might be a loss of controlled listening, a failure of adequate hearing, even if this is only temporary. I think that when a foreign element is introduced in an established idiom, in an established language, it creates a sort of irritation, but also a sort of challenge. It destabilizes it, but also uh, in a constructive way, expands the possibilities of meaning and uh, therefore also has a, a um, yeah, like a constructive aspect to it. Both of these are fine characteristic of what I call syntactic noise uh, and, and that again, um, I f uh, what I find most important about this is that it's a notion of noise which is con uh, context dependent and which doesn't rely on a definition of noise which is universally valid. I would also like to um, differentiate another sort of noise which I call a liminal noise. Liminal noise, uh, I call any stimulation of the senses that touches uh, the upper or lower limits of the processing capability, capability of our senses. So anything what is really offending the, uh, or assaulting the senses in a way. For example, sounds that are painfully loud or light that is blinding, things that are too fast to be processed or uh, on the other end, uh, sounds that are too soft or light intensities that are creating a darkness which both make it difficult to properly perceive. So this idea of noise has a sort of more um, absolute value to it. Um, since it confronts the limitations of our senses, it appears to be a more direct and unmediated experience than syntactic noise. However, I would argue that even what I call liminal noise is a subject to interpretation and is therefore at the same time always also syntactic noise. For example, um, you might think that uh, something what's causing physical pain, a very loud sound, that the physical pain that it entails becomes uh, a sort of absolute experience in the sense also of a meaning that is attributed for, uh, to something. But I think that's actually not the case because for example when amplification was introduced in uh, rock music and when amplification systems became more powerful in the 60s uh, there was a lot of controversy about it. It was described as noise, as damaging to the ears and uh, it was also perceived to be very aggressive. Um, and that aggressiveness was also becoming part of the message of the music, which often was probably also the intention of the artists. Still, I think that nowadays when you go 
for example, to cheesy pop concerts, they're probably much louder than anything they could have produced in the 60s, simply because we have uh, very different equipment nowadays. And the fact that it's damaging to the ears is nowadays not perceived as a part of a message or a meaning. It's uh, just become part of a style and it's, it's nobody's really pondering about it. It's just the way how pop music is presented. So even if our senses get damaged, we are still interpreting this as a sort of message and the damage that it creates is not creating a sort of absolute experience, in my opinion. Um, next, I would like to show you another example from a work of mine. This is a piece for analog electronics and uh, laser projections. It's actually a sort of um, working progress. It's a sort of structured improvisation. And it's a piece which I'm gradually developing. I've uh, performed it several times and every time I do it, I do it slightly differently. And um, I'm using musical sounds which are quite harsh. And so I was uh, also looking for an, an equivalent in lighting for this harshness. And so I was actually looking for a sort of dirty light. This is from a performance that I gave in uh, a media school in Japan last fall. Um, what I did in this piece is um, I'm, I'm actually pointing the laser beam on different objects. So these are not images which are directly projected by the laser beam, but uh, I'm using different materials where the uh, concentrated laser beam is going through, for example, uh, glass objects, but also, for example, a wax crayon. And then uh, when the laser beam hits it, the material starts to melt and then also the reflected image is changing through time. And um, these different objects for me also entail a sort of haptic quality, which um, already gave a 
different sense of materiality, so to say, than, for example, a pure laser beam. So for me, this is a sort of, um, well, I, for me, this uh, word dirty light is just a metaphor, but uh, this would be one form of it, a sort of uh, syntactic dirty light, you could say. Um, what I'm also doing in this piece is uh, changing uh, the image quite fast at certain moments, which is then uh, creating a sort of liminal noise, you could say, because it's uh, uh, sometimes having almost a sort of stroboscopic effect. And yeah, these are like different ways how I try to explore it in this piece. Uh, next, I would like to p uh, play you an excerpt from a very different piece for a pianist and also lighting. In this piece, I'm also actually using uh, lighting in moments where, it, where there is no music. And it comes out in the composition. My idea was that it's a sort of visual continuation where the music died away and it, in a way, continues visually. And as you can see, I'm using three arrays of lamps that are pointed towards the audience. Therefore, they are blinding them, which I would again call a sort of liminal noise. I'm also using fog, which is again creating a sort of diffused texture. There are also two lamps pointing underneath the piano. <clears throat> this piece is actually inspired uh, partly by alchemy and by heavy metal at the same time. So uh, the, vo uh, the, the use of vocals is inspired by heavy metal. And um, I was reading different texts by uh, uh, alchemists from alchemist sources in that time. And uh, what I found very interesting is, for example, that also they considered light to be the medium that, that God co uses to communicate with mankind. That's why astrology also used to play a very important role in alchemy, because that the configuration of the stars was always also a message to, to the world, so to say. So my very original idea for the setup of the piece was to create a simplified image of the universe, the grand piano being the flat 
earth, underneath you have the steaming chamber, which is hell, and then uh, around it the uh, three lamps are like symbolizing the stars that are communicating. Well, while I was um, thinking about light and sound and the different relationships they can have, um, I eventually came to look at it as a so-called symbolic form, which is a term that I borrowed from a semiology, or uh, especially from one specific book, which is from the musicologist Jean-Jacques Natier. Uh, Jean-Jacques Natier um, applied, uh, he wrote a quite influential book in the late 80s which is called Music and Do Discourse and he applied the theory of semiology to music and the analysis of music and I didn't take over his uh, theory but there were some terms that he used which I found very helpful and so he speaks of a sound or music being a symbolic form a symbolic form carries meaning, carries meaning. And the idea of meaning uh, which can be attributed to music is of course a very different one than uh, sort of verbal meaning or uh, in a linguistic sense. Here are two quotes from Jean-Jacques Natier to, uh, to explain this a little bit, he, he says, for example, human beings are symbolic animals. Confronted with a trace, they will seek to interpret it, to give it meaning. We ascribe meaning by grasping the traces we find, artworks that ensue from a creative act. This is exactly what happens with music. Um, the way how I understood it, the whole idea of semiology is in a way that everything what mankind does is a symbolic act. Uh, they also sometimes refer to it as a, a social fact, a total social fact, and that everything uh, is interpreted in a certain way. And that's how this uh, idea which was first used in linguistics of having a sign, and, uh, a signifier and a signified has uh, been applied also to very uh, different fields, well, including music. Uh, here is another quote, um, musical meaning situates itself in the correspondence between a formal musical structure and an external structure belonging to lived experience. So it's a very broad idea of what meaning can be and certainly not a very precise one and especially not a fixed meaning. That's in a way also the whole point that uh, everybody interprets signs and meanings and symbols in different ways. Here is a chart uh, that I developed um, and which in a way helps me to think in a more differentiated way about sound and light and how they can relate to each other. So I started out with this uh, symbolic form a symbolic form which is carrying some sort of meaning. I included this noise element as a, this foreign element which constantly challenges established meanings and expand, expands what um, meaning can be or actually it expands a certain musical or artistic language or idiom. Then noise is then again subdivided in the two sorts of noise which I mentioned, the liminal noise and the syntactic noise, while the liminal noise is always also at the same time syntactic noise. And uh, all of that together creates a reference. And here are two other uh, terms that I borrowed from Jean-Jacques Natier. 
because he's uh, differentiating between so-called intrinsic and extrinsic references. Intrinsic references are basically all relationships between uh, that are all, or you could also say all structures, uh, structures that are established within the materials of a certain um, medium. For example, in music, this could be melody or harmony or timbre. So for example, when you have a theme, a melody in the beginning of a sonata and the theme comes back at the end of the sonata, it's uh, creating a reference to the theme which was there before. And so does every motivic cell which was uh, used in the piece. And um, extrinsic references are all references that go beyond the materiality of uh, an art form. So for example, in music, every sort of direct imitation would be an extrinsic reference. For example, when Mahler is using cowbells in a symphony to evoke the image of uh, the Alps, that's an extrinsic reference. But extrinsic references can also be much more subtle than that. Um, for example, there is a violin concerto by Alban Berg, which is star starting with the open four strings of the violin, which are G, D, A, E. In the entire piece, uh, these, this harmony that he establishes in the beginning is also uh, embedded in the whole harmonic structure of the piece. Still, I would also call this an extrinsic reference because by starting the piece with these open strings is also in a way pointing at the instrument as uh, something given by musical culture that we grow up with as something which has grown through history. Uh, another example would be, for example, uh, there is a book of etudes for, for piano by Frédéric Chopin, Opus 10 which, uh, and the first one has large arpeggios through the entire range of the piano. And uh, he actually composed this also as a reference to the beginning of the Well-Tempered Piano by Bach, which is uh, the first prelude is also uh, consisting only of, of arpeggios, but in a much smaller range. And well, not by coincidence, both are in C major. So this is also creating an extrinsic reference, but still in music. Uh, the two last uh, examples, uh, there it's not really relevant whether the listener really understands these references. Uh, you can still enjoy the etudes by Chopin without knowing that he uh, wrote this as a sort of reference to Bach. But uh, when you happen to know it, it definitely opens another channel of interpretation. And when thinking about lighting, I believe that you can also apply uh, this differentiation to, to light. Intrinsic would be all references within a light composition, for example, which are determined by the choices of colors, for example, or shapes, or how rhythm is used. And uh, extrinsic references can be psychological or also imitations or physiological. For example, color. When you use a certain color, it also refers to a certain way how, how we perceive this color. And in our culture, we usually uh, perceive red as being much warmer than blue. And so this is also using, uh, creating an extrinsic reference at the same time when you use it as an intrinsic uh, element in a composition. A shape can also function like an extrinsic reference. Uh, for example, I, I like to, uh, to use moving headlamps, but I often find that when you have a moving headlamp, it also reminds me of searchlights and searchlights again, can have a whole different connotation of associations which are maybe partly violent or war related. So you can also get a sort of imitational quality by using uh, light. Uh, rhythm as well in music as, in, uh, as visually, it can also create a sort of uh, physiological response through kinesthetic uh, reactions. Um, 
rhythms, generally speaking, res uh, respond also, our muscles also respond to rhythms. And so every use of rhythm also has this uh, physiological aspect to it. Um, this chart, in a way, helps me to think of the different elements how you can use sound or lighting in relation to each other in a more differentiated way. And, uh, well, to, to approach it a, um, a bit more analytically. So, to finish up, I would like to play a few more excerpts from different pieces of mine where I uh, use sound and light. Uh, this is a piece for electric violin, live electronics, lighting and laser. Well, this is a piece which was uh, strongly inspired by Japanese mangas, so I'm uh, deliberately using a kind of more spectacle-like uh, light setting. Also a lot of, in fact, a lot of synchronization between sound and light. And um, yeah, I think I'll just move on to the next piece, which is uh, again a piece for my ensemble, Back in Zoop, which we performed at the Huddersfield uh, Festival last year. And uh, here again, I'm using a light uh, in a conceptually different way. Um, I have to explain a little bit how the piece is built. Um, it consists of uh, four larger sections, which are all identical in duration. And uh, the first three sections are all very different in style. The first one is a sort of uh, yeah, almost a kind of prog rock uh, piece. The second one is a very cheesy Muzak reference. The third one is a sort of uh, more electric uh, avant-garde piece, a uh, little bit referring to Helmut Lachenmann. And then the very last section is uh, a literal superimposition of those uh, first three. My idea was when you first uh, see the piece that uh, you don't actually establish a relationship between the uh, different sections. As I said, each one is written in a totally different musical style. 
and then uh, the last uh, section when they all resound together uh, for me is a sort of well, a revelation that actually the pieces are composed in such a way that they do belong together and they interlock very precisely and together they create again a sort of fourth piece. And uh, the way I use the lighting here is uh, try to anticipate the superimposition of the sections which is eventually going to happen at the end of the piece. So in the beginning of the, uh, in the first uh, section, uh, I'm just using a blue background, um, which is slightly changing. Uh, but then in the second uh, section, I'm actually using a direct dynamic translation of that first uh, section only visually. So uh, you see actually the first se uh, section that you already heard. And uh, so my, my idea was that obviously the, um, who's sitting in the concert wouldn't recognize this, oh, I'm seeing the rhythm from the first section, not in such an analytical way, but that in a certain sense, um, the idea of superimposition and uh, of interlocking uh, apparently contradictory elements is already presented, although not all in music, but then divided by, uh, into the visual and the uh, acoustic field. So I'll just play you the first about two minutes from the first, the second, and then the last section. I'm going to skip the third one. Here's the second. Nope, that's one too far. Here it is. So what you see the, with the red light in the background is a literal translation of the dynamics of the different instruments and the different registers of the instruments distributed through this um, entire screen.
And since the music is composed in such a way that the sections in ac actually work very well together, the light looks uh, unusually busy for this sort of cheesy music, but um, it's not out of sync. There are constantly moments where um, they are corresponding very well with each other. And here is uh, finally an excerpt from the last section. Um, in the last section, the musicians are uh, not playing for uh, longer parts, so I'm using only the upper half of the screen also for the lighting. Okay, that's all. Thank you very much. Do you have any questions? <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the title of it? Yeah, yeah. Uh, it's a uh, um, rational cantilena in nine triads is the complete title. Yeah. Um, you mentioned that some of the text um, came from alchemist, alchemist sources. Yes. Can you specify what exactly? Oh my God, I forgot some of it. Um, I'm using two different sources. One of them was um, I forgot his first name. His last name is Meyer, and he used. Uh, he actually wrote a text which is uh, which was called. I think. Arithmetic cantilena, or something like that. Oh, I really don't remember precisely. And um, then I'm using some texts by Roger Bacon. Yeah. This Meyer lived in, a, it was a Renaissance alchemist, so I think his texts are from the 16th century. Yeah. Then um, Roger Bacon is 13th century. Yeah. And uh, I also used an, an anonymous text which is from the same period, like Roger Bacon. I think first it was attributed to him, but then later it was declared anonymous. And did you indicate how the painters should perform their texts? Um, like, like in the school, how did you, were there any particular rules that you wanted them to perform? I only described the sort of uh, voice I wanted to have. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to have like this pitchless uh, voice, which is very characteristic of heavy metal. And uh, when I started thinking about this piece, I was particularly interested in heavy metal and also in uh, many of the ancient symbols that uh, they use. And through reading about these things, I stumbled upon alchemy. And then I uh, found out that 
by coincidence, the biggest library in the world of alchemist texts are in Amsterdam. I live in Amsterdam, actually quite close to where I live that uh, this library is. And then I went there and I found this very fascinating. And yeah, that's how this piece came together. One second, please. Uh, Graham, tell me when, when you need to cut. Uh, we need to, um, first of all, acknowledge also that we're online. So mm -hmm. thank you to New York and Marlon Barrio Salana, our, <laughs> our producer. We are webcasting the talk. I also would like to mention that uh, the, the Center for Contemporary and Digital Performance is very happy to have a guest today for music and also have so many of uh, the students and researchers and staff from music here. And we'd like to do more of these kind of collaborations and also allow uh, some of the, perhaps the research students to get to know each other more. Um, because I think the dialogue between our disciplines uh, is uh, in a way challenged here. And if I may say so in theater, uh, light is, although crucial, often a step, a step child of our uh, analytical or theoretical reflection. Yeah, we don't really have a lot of literature on the light as a time-based medium. So I think uh, we would love to hear more comments on, let's say, how you uh, notion of the question, so that in case the viewers did not hear it, they can recapitulate. Mm -hmm. are, we, are we running? Yes. So the first question by Caroline Wilkins was on the notion of the, your use of alchemy yes. as, a, as an inspiration. So thank you very much. And please, let's hear some more uh, commentaries and questions. Yes. And uh, I was, while I was watching uh, various examples, I was wondering um, if you imagine, for example, the, the thing you did with Japan with the laser. Can you imagine the replacing your music with some, uh, you know, Badaggio uh, by Barber, something very calm, uh, very not noisy? Do you think the light, in that context, the light would still seem dirty? Okay, so the question was whether uh, the lighting that I'm using and that I'm calling dirty light would also appear to be dirty if there was a different sort of music, for example, Samuel Barber's Adagio. Um, I think it would definitely appear to be sort of hyperactive in comparison to the Adagio by Barber, uh, if, uh, if he would use the laser example. Um, I think it very, uh, it's difficult to, uh, to answer this. I think it uh, depends on, uh, I think uh, on, on what you're focusing on. For example, the light, which I uh, called like different textures of lighting, also in this uh, improvisation, which I showed with these uh, different reflections from the material. I think if you would see that in a different context, um, it m might not appear as dirty light at all. And uh, other things, I think um, fast stroboscopic things it's very questionable whether that's a form of dirty light, but I think that that would definitely be more a, co a contradiction to a sort of music like uh, Samuel Bar Barber's is. And um, generally speaking, I think the way how you perceive the light is certainly very context dependent also on, the, uh, on how you co uh, combine it with what sort of music? So, so to, to, uh, sort, of, sort of makes more sense because with these video clips you can replace the music with something else, and it's it, it's, it's, a, it's not a very uh, robust or artistic test, but it sort of uh, it can give you a hint. Yes. Yes, that's true. I mean, that's something what Michel Chion has done, done a lot of film when he analyzed film, that he uh, played sections from film and just took away the music or he added some other music to it and uh, observed how it came across. And it was always very different. And I'm sure that this would uh, be the case here as well. But that's an interesting point, I should do that. Because it might also reveal some uh, other effects that it has 
um, some other possibilities of combining things because the brain constantly tries to create connections between what you hear and what you see. And uh, yeah, that would probably be an interesting thing to try out. And I suppose the, the, the coining of, a, of this terminology of the dirty light is a provocation in a way. And as you noticed, he's referring to anthropology at some point and Mary Douglas. And, and we have a theater uh, researcher here who is working on yeah, Nilfer, where are you? On, on the grotesque in, in performance, on the grotesque, which would, again, compared to order or to the norm, would be considered a sort of a, a side product of the norm, that you have certain kinds of performance that appear to us as uh, abnormal, yeah, mm. grotesque. Mm. So you, you're bringing in an in a anthropological or maybe a cultural or philosophical notion. But when I was watching, let's say, the laser piece in particular, it occurred to me also that we may think of theater light as something that has to do with, with color and, and focus and intensity, yeah, low, high, and so on. But with the laser, uh, you're creating more images, mm -hmm. uh, where I think my, my association would be perhaps not so much with dirty, but more with the abstraction or the, the movement of the image. Whereas with the light in the last piece you showed, it seems to be basically stronger or less strong. Yes, yeah. And it's a square thing. And mm. I'm not sure whether it actually makes me think about dirty at all. I'm also not saying that uh, all examples that I showed are dirty light. Um, anyway, I'm myself also very much questioning this term. For me, it's more uh, a sort of idea. And I'm through thinking about what dirty light might possibly be. I, uh, it's giving me different answers. But I'm not saying that everything I've presented is dirty light. Well, there are some pieces where I, oh, I really try to achieve something like dirty light. For example, um, in this improvisation with the laser that I showed to you, or the, the blinding aspect in the alchemist piece, that are things that I deliberately did with the idea in mind that this could introduce some sort of dirtiness which responds to sort of dirtiness which is also present in the music. But for example, the last piece, I don't think that's a dirty light at all. Uh, also actually the uh, laser piece, uh, the other one with the violin is not, I didn't compose it with dirty light in my mind. But another aspect in that laser piece, uh, on the other hand, is that I'm uh, the laser that I have and that I always use for performances is a rather cheap one. Uh, and the scanner it uses is not very good. So it's relatively slow compared to professional lasers. So this is uh, creating this sort of flickering effect, which normally you wouldn't have with a better laser. And um, I bought this laser before I composed the piece, and in a way also this uh, uh, weakness of the laser inspired this piece. In fact, uh, the, cart uh, the manga that I'm using is um, a Japanese manga which has a very short excerpt of like five or six seconds where some sort of bomb blows up, and then you see flashes of red and blue. And uh, when this was aired in Japan, I think it was in the early 90s, uh, 500 kids were hospitalized because they had epileptic uh, seizures. And that was, of course, not the intention of the makers. That was a kind of uh, shocking thing that this happened. Uh, children apparently react uh, on this much more sensitively. And uh, so the whole piece is more about this uh, phenomenon of stroboscopic effects and it was not uh, so much concerned about dirtiness. Can I ask a very, sorry, there you go, Rob, okay. um, Can I ask a very pragmatic question, Michael? Um, two of the pieces that you showed us were um, essentially solo pieces, so solo violin piece and solo piano piece. Mm -hmm. And I was particularly struck with a solo piano piece that was played in a concert venue that I know quite well, I've played it myself and so forth in Denmark. Yeah. My, my question is, if you write a piece like that for a pianist as part of a more or less normal recital, let's say, and 
and yet the performance of the piece requires all this other stuff, all this lighting equipment, dry ice, you know, all these kind of things. Um, how have you found venues responding to this request? Because it's obviously a very unusual request. I'd like to do a piano title, but I'd like to also bring in all this other material. Has that been an actual practical problem for you, or how have you found ways to get around that? Well, um, often it has, yes. And um, it very much depends on where the piece is performed. Uh, for example, Huddersfield, it was no problem at all. They knew already one year before exactly what lighting equipment I would like to use, and they approved that, and that was no problem at all. But then uh, most of the time, I have to take care of the equipment myself. And also in Den Bosch, they uh, rented the equipment, but uh, I had to like find a place where you can rent it. I had to choose the equipment. and. In other venues, I often also have to use what's there, which um, often entails problems. For example, uh, five days later, uh, after this performance in Den Bosch, we did the same piano piece in Hamburg in a, a theater, and uh, they didn't have the this small strip lights that I used uh, that were uh, pointed towards the audience, but they had uh, much stronger floodlights. And uh, the light intensity here was, I think, uh, 800 watt maximum, all three lamps together. And then in Hamburg, I had f four kilowatts. And um, it, it didn't work. I mean, the blinding worked very well. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, I, I just realized that because I have also these other two lamps underneath uh, the piano, which were in both instances uh, one kilowatt lamps each, um, they were just much too weak in comparison to the, uh, the ones that are pointed to the audience. I think in Den Bosch, it worked OK. What also played an important, uh, what was also an important factor is that in uh, Den Bosch, uh, the background, and background is not entirely black, yes. but it was like grayish. So you could also see the shadows of the piano quite clearly coming from the lamps that were pointed at the piano. And in Hamburg, we had a black background and then the, uh, those floodlights that were much stronger, and it didn't work at all. Yeah. And, um, I also think that's, that's also things that I'm learning in the process. I usually just try to use what's available and do the best uh, out of it. But uh, I notice that I have to be more precise about what equipment I really need for a specific piece because uh, it was most obvious in this, uh, in this case with these two performances of this piano piece because in Hamburg it was really horrible. Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah thank, um, it seems that uh, it's a very fertile period for you in, in that you've composed a lot in the last two or three years with this um, idea of, of Dirty Light, uh, whether or not you feel it goes into your compositions. I was just interested to know how you feel that your compositional approach has changed since you focused on Dirty Light. Oh, that's a very interesting question. Um, when I started this PhD, I in a way also made a commitment to now produce mainly lights, uh, pieces that would include light, uh, lighting in uh, some way. And uh, so I was um, also trying to find the opportunities to produce uh, such works. Probably if I wouldn't have started this PhD, I probably wouldn't have produced quite as many pieces for uh, sound and light. But uh, still some of the pieces I, uh, for example, again, the last piece, the one which was performed in Huddersfield, uh, I consider it also a piece which could be performed without the lighting. It doesn't totally depend on the lighting. So I also allow myself to uh, sometimes think more in terms of music than necessarily always um, taking care of both aspects uh, with the same weight, so to say. I much prefer to perform it with lighting. I think it does work better, but I uh, think the, work, uh, the music works by itself. Whereas uh, with the, uh, both solo pieces, neither the violin piece nor the piano piece, I would like to have uh, performed without uh, the lights. Um, this doesn't really answer your question. Um, I think 
we've talked about it at one point. Uh, I, I can't answer, of course, the question about how one affects the other, but certainly it seems to me that the research would seem to invite idea that you uh, would spend maybe a week together with some lighting artists in the studio. If you had a studio here, a theatre studio, yeah, and you'd actually work for a sustained period of time with with good instruments, allowing you to experiment in many ways, yeah, that I think would be very fruitful and I'm not sure that we can provide that often, yeah, these kind of um, intermedial collaborations. Um, where you can also figure out, for example, whether if you work a lot with light, how will you change your compositional approach? Mm -hmm. If you actually were to use that in, in, in your whole compositional approach, yeah, in all time. I mean, it's the same when we work with technologies. Uh, we have to almost really, over a long period of time, learn this language. Yes. It affects us uh, performatively, yeah? And one observation, by the way, the performers tend to be mostly static. Yes. In the sense that they are locked in, in, a, in a performance place where the instrument or the microphone is there. Yes. Have you considered making them move more freely? Not really, no. Yes. It was the sense of touch, mm. which really did convey to me the kind of relationship between that and normal lighting, for example, of room or shadow, um, in the sort of parallel situation of music versus noise. And I thought that piece was amazing. I thought visually it was so rich. Um, oh, thank yeah, you. It was fantastic. <laughs> it was really, it was quite surprising, actually, because I don't, I don't, I haven't seen much sort of virtuosic. Thank you. Yeah, I, uh, actually also I would like to explore this approach further because I find it very uh, fascinating, uh, the complexity you can uh, get with uh, simply pointing a laser beam at any object. Uh, it doesn't work with all objects. You have to choose carefully, but you can get uh, really amazing results. And uh, in this violin piece, I use the laser more in the sort of uh, pattern way with the built-in patterns that uh, lasers have built in. And uh, for me, this works with this particular piece because it's about uh, cartoons and about this uh, screen shape. And so I just uh, work with uh, horizontal and vertical lines. And uh, in a way, it was a sort of replacement of the TV screen. That was basically the idea. But um, generally, I also find it more interesting to work uh, in uh, with uh, reflections like this, which is technologically extremely banal, but uh, the results it gives you are can be quite fascinating. And then one more. I'm wondering whether you've had much feedback from people who do do lighting design, because it seemed to me that one of the things that's so interesting about this is that compared to what happens in most lit concerts, which is predominantly rock and pop music, um, where you get a sort of orchestral use of light, mm. um, usually, like you said at the beginning, absolutely synchronized with the music. Um, what you're doing is much more like what we do as musicians with small ensembles, is that you, you don't add four more violins for this moment because that just wouldn't sound nice. You, you stick with your one violin. So you've got the sort of chamber music, chamber lighting, which is quite, you know, that's, even in the theatre, that's relatively unusual because, you know, in a space like this, a lighting designer would probably decide that they would want to use 16 or 20 lights, but you're just using, I mean, do they like it? Have, has anybody said, why are you, only, why are you using so few lights? Uh, N no, unfortunately, I didn't get much feedback from lighting designers. Um, also, not many lighting designers have seen my work. I have, uh, I have uh, tried to get more in contact with lighting designers, but uh, and also get uh, their feedback. But until now, occasionally, I did speak with some people about it, but uh, not very thoroughly. Mm. 
and uh, no, nobody asked me why I used that, uh, uh, such a reduced setup. But uh, well, the reason is, um, again, it depends a little bit on the piece. Of course, when I have a, a very intimate piece like the piano uh, setting, then I would find it inappropriate to have 80 moving headlamps uh, going along with it. But um, often it's also very pragmatic. As I said, I usually have to take care of the lighting myself and um, usually there are no budgets and or very limited budgets and uh, often it's also the easiest solution to just bring the equipment along. So by now I've also uh, collected a number of lamps that I can just drag out of my basement and use them in concert situations. But that's just imposing very practical limitations in terms of quantity, uh, quality as well. Oh, yes. <laughs> oh, that's a nice one. <laughs> <laughs> At least. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. The, the sort of blinding lights reminded me of the Frank A. V. performance. Of who? Sorry? Frank A. V. He's a performance artist and he was kind of a light I don't know him. Blind. Yeah, well, it'd be interesting for you to know because it's a similar idea of just intense blinding. But yeah. Yeah, it'd be quite interesting to take that to the extreme. Because there's also the, the possibility of doing sort of intertextual lighting, which I guess you can get your model with your references at the bottom, because a lot of lighting states do have references to other conventions. I mean, particularly, I was, the moment I saw your blinding lights, um, I'm afraid to say it reminded me of the Who in the 70s, right. because th they were one of the first people who used to do that, and it was a way of saying the show's almost over, or here they are, <laughs> and then... <laughs> and setting, I, well, it is a, as I said, this is a, um, in this piece, it's also heavy metal reference. They are using yeah. it a lot. Yeah. And it's, well, it's just uh, also one of these ways to uh, mysteriorize the stage and the performers because you can't see them properly anymore. I'm afraid we're running out of time, but there is occasion for you to meet Marco afterwards, and we're probably going to go for a cup of coffee in the Rococo. So thank you very much for coming, and thank you, Marco, for your lecture. Yeah? Thank you very much. <laughs>